So first of all, thank you so much uh, for taking some time uh, to, to share with us. Um, uh, we're quite excited about the book. Um, just a little bit of background on who I am. I'm, uh, I work with a company called Cognizant. Uh, Cognizant is a big technology services company. We've got about 180,000 people. We'll end the year at a roughly 10 billion um, in, in revenue. So we do all of the things you would expect, infrastructure work, application work, consulting. Uh, so that's, a, that's Cognizant. But I have the coolest job in Cognizant because I run the, what's called the Center for the Future of Work. And that's where you're supposed to go, ooh, because that's the, that, thank you very much. Okay, so that's a, that's the, it is the coolest job in Cognizant because I get to try and figure out, like with my team, because I'm not smart enough, but, but we get to try and figure out what is going to happen with business and technology, not just quarter over quarter, but year over year. And, and so I'm here today to share a few minutes uh, to tell you a, a story about the book that you have in front of you. And it, it all started with us wondering, the Center for the Future of Work team and, and the authors, what is really happening with business and technology? Because we were looking out at all kinds of data and all kinds of um, uh, input from customers uh, that we were having, and we were wondering, what's, what's really going on? And the big question was, how does the trillion dollar club, and for those of you that uh, maybe don't know the, the numbers, you, you know the, the names for sure, six companies, 10 years, one trillion dollars in overall market value created in a, in a remarkably short time. And if you don't believe me, uh, here's, here's the data. In 2003, Amazon was about 23 billion, Apple was 8.9, Facebook was not even founded yet, uh, Google was private, Pandora was private, Netflix was actually bigger than I thought they were, they're at about 1.5 billion, but you add them all up in 2003, the total market capitalization was about 34 billion dollars, but in just 10 years, it went to 1.2 trillion dollars. And so we wondered if you took the trillion dollar club and how did that relate to many industries that were absolutely being destroyed and disrupted? And this was the, the, the question that, that launched this whole thing. And, and, and just to give you a bit of data, here's Kodak, right? We're taking more pictures than ever before on Earth and yet Kodak, the brand that actually made this possible, is bankrupt. As well in movies, right? Americans are watching more movies at home than ever before, but Blockbuster is, is suffered the similar fate. And if you can't see that in the back, that says LOL Netflix. <laughs> and as, uh, it, just to keep going a little bit, Borders, uh, one of the, one, you know, actually books are doing fine. People are reading more and more books all over the world. And Borders, one of the main brands that made this possible, is also bankrupt. And from the Department of Irony, maybe you can't see that, that's hashtag is your business next? And finally, HMV. Music is something that is, didn't, you know, it used to come in the home through radio, but it, companies like HMV, and I love this old picture, uh, it, and it used to be called His Master's Voice, that's the little dog listening to the record. Uh, one of the companies that made this possible, that brought music into the home, also bankrupt. So industry after industry, sector after sector, in a very rapid rate, these, are all, these all went down over the last few years, and we said, what is going on? And upon further reflection, we decided that something might be really wrong with how companies were being configured. So trillion dollar club, market disruption in multiple sectors. And we, our assertion, our hypothesis at this point became many firms are configured for the past and not unleashing their potential value. And in fact, many will face an extinction event unless they begin to adapt to this new digital reality. And further, our, our, our assumption here at this point was that new technologies are transforming not only business, not only how we move through our normal day-to-day -day life, but also how commerce is being conducted. So this is not just a technology shift, it is a macroeconomic social shift that's going on. And much of this is based on what we call the smack stack. And you know this, right? You, you guys you live in this world. Social computing, mobility, advanced analytics, cloud-enabled solutions, the smack stack is changing how businesses are doing work, but it changed our personal lives first, right? The smack stack was a consumer-grade technology experience. We begin, you know, mobile devices, uh, using uh, social media, advanced analytics that companies like Amazon and Netflix were using, cloud computing, which is the fabric that underlays a lot of these solutions and technologies. 
th we felt this first in our personal lives, but now it's changing very rapidly, changing how enterprises are engaging with us and how they're doing uh, their own work. And what's really important about this, and you guys know this, right, because Noblis does a lot of work in, in uh, data science, big data analytics, and you know, probably better than, uh, than most folks, that the smack stack is creating a quagmire. It's becoming, more and more companies are finding, well, we have all this data, but we're really not sure what to do with it and what it means. So to boil it down a little bit, here's a little bit of data on data. It's something we call the 50-50 context of 2020, which is not that far away. It sounds a little bit far, but it's not really that far away. But when you look at the data and you look at multiple studies, you find that 50 billion devices generating 50 times the data of now. And that becomes an incredible opportunity, but also an incredible challenge, because how do we make meaning of that? And that's the big question, and that's the reason for the story around Code Halos because it all comes down to making meaning of this flood of data. Just one, I, you know, one data point on data, 83.8 exabytes, this is the anticipated 2015 monthly global IP traffic, 80, almost 84 exabytes. Now, I am not smart enough to know what an exabyte is. I couldn't grasp that, but I found this wonderful bit of information that one exabyte, one exabyte is 50,000 years of streaming DVD video. That's Finding Nemo 50,000 years over and over, and it's like my house, over and over and over. <laughs> That's one exabyte. So this is monthly global IP traffic. And you can look at that, right? You're all kind of you know, scientific and technology professionals. You look at that and go, well, that's a lot of data, but so what? Who cares? And the real point of this is that companies now are beginning to compete on code. They're beginning to change their value propositions to compete on code, which we think means, it, we call that the data and information that now surrounds not only ourselves and our personal lives, but organizations, devices from the Internet of Things, and even brands, companies' brands. All of that becomes a, a halo, if you will, of code. And so, so now data and devices and people are generating massive amounts of data and information, and we are calling this, uh, you know, and you can almost see it, a code, a code halo. So if you step out of your work context for a second, uh, you, you know, your lunch work context, and think about your own personal experience, have you ever felt at, at home now, have you ever felt that companies like Pandora and Spotify and Netflix and Google and Facebook and Twitter, it almost feels like sometimes when you engage with them, they're reading your mind. Like you'll type something in and you're like, wow, I didn't think of that. And, and, uh, or, or they'll offer a movie or a book. Amazon will give you a uh, saying, look, this is something you might be interested in. And the fact is that they are. And these companies have become almost, you know, Alexander, the man who knows. And they know us better now because of the code that we share with them. They know you. They know me because of the information that we share with them day after day, click after swipe, after buy, after like, after thumbs up or thumbs down. Every time we do that, we're sharing something that we care about with these companies. And they've figured out how to make meaning from it. And now we all have these information code halos from every interaction that we have with LinkedIn or, or, or Netflix where we watch movies or Pandora where we manage our careers. And every click or buy or swipe or like or add Every virtual life action that we engage in in our personal lives creates a virtual you and a virtual me. And that halo of code is becoming more and more valuable to companies all over the world. And so now when Amazon, Netflix, and Apple, and Pandora look at me, right, in speaking somewhere in, in Asia at that point, uh, they don't just see, you know, mediocrely dressed, you know, rapidly, uh, you know, you know th thoroughly in middle-aged, you know, white guy, they see, a f they see this. They see a father of two girls. They see an extreme traveler. I ride a, a bicycle poorly, but I like it. I have, you know, weird film tastes. I like John Coltrane a lot. I'm not fond of Justin Bieber that much. I used to be a musician. I used to be uh, an analyst. In fact, I used to be with Forrester Research. I used to come out here to visit CSC all the time, so it was fun to come back here. But I also have a career history, a financial history, a health history, and more and more companies are, are looking at this data that I'm willingly sharing, and they're making meaning out of my code halo. And where this is getting really exciting, you know, for all kinds of companies is some companies will see all of this data and information, and they'll say, this is just noise, it's just static. 
but other companies are seeing business meaning and they're beginning to unlock real levels of value. And they're doing this because they're being able to sort the signal from the noise. And this is becoming one of the key differentiators of business success over the next 10, 15 years. So let's look at a couple examples. Did you know, for example, that your music preferences were tied to your political preferences? In fact, if you like, you know Garth Brooks, right? If you like Garth Brooks, the chances are it's a high correlation that you vote Republican. Remember him? Garth George. But it goes farther than that. It turns out that if you like Madonna, the chances are highly correlated that you will vote Democrat. No jokes about what he's smoking, we don't know. But your chances, but it, what is interesting is that your taste in music, which starts out a little bit silly, but it reveals a lot more. It turns out that if you like Jimi Hendrix, you also like science fiction. So now we're getting into, you know, hey, how do you do that? But it's an interesting correlation. But it gets even farther than that. It turns out that your taste in music is also correlated potentially with your intelligence. And if you don't believe me, you should check out www.music that makes you dumb. <laughs> And this is a, it sounds silly, but it's a really interesting study because what this guy did was he looked at all of the average college entry exam scores, which are available, and he looked at what, he correlated that to what do college uh, listening, uh, what, 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 what's high on the charts for each individual school. And it turns out that the, you know, the nerdy kids really dig Beethoven. Um, you know, Nora Jones and the Radiohead and the U2, or you got the arty emo kids that are, that are pretty clever. And Rage Against the Machine, the Grateful Dead are kind of in the middle. But down here on the other end, right, if the kids are listening, so if Junior's listening to, to Lil Wayne or Soka, it might be time for a, a talk. <laughs> now, so there's no indication of ca causation here, but it's highly correlated. So, what's imp so this is a little bit silly, but who would have guessed that your music library could provide such rich customer insight, rich understanding of who somebody is. So let's, I know it's lunchtime, so let's play a little bit of a game. This is a quiz. This is Pandora. Every upvote gets you closer to your perfect station, Pandora, now playing you. All right, maybe you know this. Let's, this is the quiz part. Pandora uses your music taste to connect you to A, LinkedIn colleagues, B, political candidates, C, the NSA, sorry, or D, Justin Bieber? What do you think? All of the above? No, this is not the trick question. What do you think? Come on, you, it's, I know it's lunchtime. Everybody's like, oh, it's, I, don't, I didn't come here to work. B, B, political candidates, very good. You're the cleverest audience. Pandora uses your music to connect you to political candidates. It gets you closer not to your perfect station, but to your perfect candidate. They use the, what you like to target ads. Facebook, next question. Facebook can predict, by looking at your posting pattern, Facebook can predict when you are A, buying a house, B, taking a vacation, C, falling in love, D, falling in love with Justin Bieber. <laughs> C, 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 oh, you are the cleverest audience. It is true, Facebook can watch us fall in love. During the 100 days before the relationship starts, we observe a slow but steady increase in the number of timeline posts shared between the future couple. After the relationship starts, they've got better things to do, and they don't post. <laughs> All right, this is for the, for the tech folks. A solid predictor of coding capability based on whether a person A, has an affinity for a particularly, particular Japanese manga site, B, has experience in a startup environment, C, has a degree in philosophy, or D, has worked on Justin Bieber's website? <laughs> C, 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 okay, finally, eh, sorry, it's actually A. It turns out, obviously not a causal relationship, but Guild has six million programmers in its database, and the correlation, even if inexplicable, is quite clear, says the chief scientist of Guild. Okay, last one. Weather data now being sold and used to A, help derivative traders, B, target specific shampoo and hair care sales, C, reduce insurance claims via an SMS warning, D, help wind farms predict the annual yield. I will not torture you. This is the only trick question. This is all of the above. In fact, this was really cool because there's a correlation for bug spray that's kind of bizarre. We found a very small difference in dew point, made a huge difference in bug spray orders. So suddenly this isn't silly, you know, Garth Brooks versus George Bush. 
It's I'm now planning my supply chain based on weather data because this is the pattern that is emerging. And this is code halo in action. So now we think any noun, any person, any place, or anything has a virtual self as well as a physical self. And the companies that can figure out how to derive value from code halos will be the ones that will succeed over time. Because it's not just in our consumer space anymore. It's happening around customers, but it's also happening around products, around brands, around employees. There are companies that are doing some remarkable things to improve an employee experience by tapping into code, as well as supply chain, which we just looked at. So all of the big elements of corporations and businesses, government agencies as well, are all beginning to unlock value from code. It's happening right now in industry after industry. And what's important for people to know, and we go into some detail, I'm not going to go into detail now, but from the book, is, is it's, this shift is following a predictable pattern. So when we looked at industry after industry, sector after sector, the companies that succeeded, the companies that lost, they followed the same pattern. Companies that focused on data and information tended to win after the crossroads. Companies that focused only on physical assets generally failed, and many faced an extinction event. And just to give you one data bit here, what happened in book retail is just one example. In the late 1990s, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, and Borders were roughly the same size, but by the mid-2000s, Amazon had, had increased significantly, Barnes & Noble was basically flat, and Borders was already starting to decline. By the 2012 or 2013, Amazon was by then 113 billion, they'd moved far beyond book retail, Borders was bankrupt, Barnes & Noble bank bouncing along on the bottom. And the reason that happened, because they missed the shift point at the crossroads about competing on code. The physical bookstores were too slow to grab the idea of we can compete on what people want and give them a better user experience. And Amazon won, and they lost. So we think the next trillion dollar club is going to come from companies and, and organizations that balance both the physical and the virtual. It's not going to be one or the other, it's going to be both. If you don't believe me, this is a really terrific data, uh, it's a great study, if you haven't read it, it's from the McKinsey Quarterly a few years ago by W. Brian Arthur. And he said, by 2025, the second economy will be as large as the 1995 physical economy. And his second economy is our, what we would call the code halo economy, the digital economy. So think about that. Throughout all of human history, the invention of accounting, the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution, the dark ages, we've achieved a certain size of physical, physical economy by 1995, and he's saying in only 30 years it will double based on code. Now, he's a pundit, right? So let's say he's 50% wrong. It, change, it still changes everything we do. Everything our companies do, everything we do in our personal lives, what we care about, how we buy things, it all shifts. And here's another bit of data from a study that we did uh, in 2013 with Oxford Economics Group. We said, what is the economic impact to companies who do this well? And the economic impact of business analytics on savings and revenue over only 12 months for just 300 companies was $766 billion. That's only 300 companies. And they were in banking and insurance and healthcare and life sciences and, and, and some other groups. But the, the takeaway for you is that that number from Brian Ar W. Brian Arthur is not so extreme. Another bit of data, this is from uh, a recent issue of Forbes. Millennials, right, the, demo the shifting demographic, they currently control about $2 trillion in liquid assets. But they, by the end of the decade, the numbers increase a surge to $7 trillion in total economic value. So everything is shifting. P how people buy, what people want to buy, what people expect from technology and companies and organizations, all of that is shifting and it's happening very rapidly. And so the question for all of us is when he connects to a branch or a store or a park or an agency, how do we connect with this person physically and virtually? Do we connect on basic demographics, just how he looks, is it more like a cold call? Or are we going to try and connect to what he really wants and knows and what, what he cares about and connecting with his code halo? 
And so then the question becomes, okay, I buy this, right? This is an, or maybe you do or maybe you don't, but it, it becomes an instantiation of, of what does big data and the Internet of Things and cloud-enabled solutions and new kinds of technologies mean to all of us as, as participants in the economy? Where do you start? And the first place, we think, is the customer interface because we believe we're entering in an era of what we're calling mass personalization. And you can see this in com with companies like Halo. If you've ordered a cab using Halo in London, it's a remarkable experience. You're not jumping around in the rain on the corner, watching for cars coming from the wrong direction. Uh, it's a, you, you basically load the app, you connect it to your credit card, and you hit the button, and then the cab comes. And if something goes wrong, they can call you, you can call the driver. It's a seamless enterprise experience, uh, seamless uh, code experience. But that's just one example. What's happening is that all of our expectations about technology are changing. We're beginning to expect, in fact, differentiate on personal and almost even sublime experiences like that. Like when we buy something with Square, which if you've done that, it's way easier than using cash. Another, another uh, great example is how many of you have been to Disney World? How many of you have been to Disney World with children? All right. So you guys know that this can be a remarkable, awful experience. Because you're at Disney, it's a very complicated thing. It's hot, it's raining, you've got little kids that you love very much, and if you get them to the Peter Pan ride and the Dumbo ears, you are really gonna be a hero, and if you blow that, you're in trouble. And Disney understands that, right? And so that's why they've created this thing called the Magic Band. Maybe some of you have used it. This is a coded bracelet to guide visitors through the park, and what they've coded it with is it becomes a park ticket, a room pass, a photo pass card, a fast pass so you can get to the right lines at the right time. You can swipe it to buy the goofy ears if you want. And Disney has invested over a billion dollars already to make this work. This is creating a code halo around theme park guests to improve their experience, to make it a personal experience. Another starting point is the product interface. It's the rise of the smart machine. And you know the examples as well, probably from the Internet of Things. Philips, for example, is reorganizing their entire company. This is a company that built light bulbs since the light bulb was invented. And now they're changing their entire organization. They're creating a digital board, a digital accelerator lab. They're changing their customer lifestyle business because now they can use data to enhance the consumer experience. And one of the things they're doing is managing space through the light bulbs that they're selling. So they can manage what's hot, is it too hot, is it too cold, what's the energy usage, who's in the room, who's not in the room. It's a remarkable code, so the building is getting a code halo. Vodafone is making your car into a phone, it's turning it into a rolling code halo generator. The Volkswagen and Audi put a SIM chip, as well as other sensors, into the car, so and it impacts entertainment, right? Play Justin Bieber, I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> Navigation, you are here. Safety, call for help, change my oil, fix my brakes. All of this is possible because it's created a code halo around the car. GE as well has sensor enabled their engines. They've created a social jet engine. GE is doing this with, with all of their, their big stuff. But the, the economics are amazing. And 1% efficiency gain is a $2 billion annual savings for airlines. So airlines like Alitalia are availing themselves of this. They're measuring, taking all the parameters. They're driving maintenance savings. They're protecting your reputation impact, ask Malaysian Airlines where their plane is, and you'll understand why this is important, right? And it's driving engineering changes. So this is all data in action. A third starting point is product design. You guys know House of Cards? You're all from the DC area like I am, so probably this resonates a little bit more than other parts of the country. So Netflix created House of Cards, and this is a terrific quote. They knew House of Cards could succeed because in any business, the ability to see into the future is the killer app. Netflix may be getting close with House of Cards, already the most streamed piece of content in the US and 40 other countries, according to Netflix. The spooky part, this is, this is the good part, executives at the company knew it would be a hit before anyone shouted action. And you're all smart, so the next question would be, well, how did they know? And they knew because they recognized the power of code that they already had. They had 27 million subscribers in the US, 33 million worldwide. The director was David Fincher, uh, or David Fincher. He was already streamed a lot, so a lot of his movies were doing well on Netflix, and films featuring Kevin Spacey also done well. The British version of House of Cards did well because we stole it from them, and when they crunched the numbers, they said, we need an American version of House of Cards directed by David Fincher, starring Kevin Spacey, and that's what they did, and this is what happened. 
3 million new subscribers. They passed HBO. The Netflix shares it released was 180 bucks. Uh, the share price a couple Saturdays ago was $425 a share. And they went critical acclaim. They had nine Emmy, nom Emmy nominations and they won a bunch of them. And they did this because they recognized the power of data and code and they figured it out. And our call to all of us is business and technology leaders now must take the steering wheel. This is a great quote. Why? Because CEOs and boards days of being absentee tech landlords are over. Forrester believes that increasing customer expectations, blah, blah, blah. The next 10 years will see more change than any time since the Great Depression in the makeup of the Fortune 1000 as some companies figure out the power of software, what we would call code, and others do not. And you can see some of the wreckage in the area already. You've already, you know that. So our call to you, our recommendation to you and, and others is if it costs more than $50 and you can't eat it, it should have a code halo around it. Now is the time to begin to ask yourselves and, and others and your customers and the government what can be sensor enabled? How can we derive value from code? Because your new mission, and our new mission, in fact, should you choose to accept it, is to manage code, to compete on knowledge and insight. And so we spent a few minutes, right, just 20 or 30 minutes, talking about the smack stack, the code halos, and three starting points, and why do these matter so much today? Right? Why, does this, why, do we, why are we linking the big data story with the Internet of Things and cloud services? We think they matter because of this terrific quote from Mary Meeker. Maybe you know her. She works at Kleiner Perkins. She was also one of the main analysts in the, in the dawn of the Internet age. And she said, we're in an era where we are reimagining nearly everything. Powered by new devices, plus connectivity, plus new user interfaces, plus beauty. Now, beauty is a weird thing to talk about in kind of science and tech uh, audience, you, you know, context, or, or CIOs, or, or what have but, but the notion of creating beautiful experiences for end users is becoming the competitive differentiator. And companies that figure out how to use data to do that are already starting to win in the market. Companies that have missed the shift are already starting to fail. And we think this is only going to accelerate. Now, that's kind of the front part of the, uh, of, of the Code Halo book. If you've enjoyed any of these uh, or, or, or been provoked by any of these ideas, there is the book that we've made available. There's also an iPad app if you're into that sort of thing. It's, it's beautiful and there's videos and you can touch it and play with it and stuff. So it's kind of it's cool that way. Um, and that's my story and, and I'm sticking to it. So, so thanks. Yeah, absolutely. My time is yours. Yeah. I noticed that, excuse me, I noticed that uh, Microsoft, for instance, was not in that list. How do you feel that they, they play in this code halo world? So they're trying to figure it out, right? A lot of the big s software players are trying, they, uh, so the, all of them I can tell you, I won't specifically call out Microsoft, but I'll, I'll give you, because we work closely with them, but I will tell you in general the large uh, software providers, whether it's Apple or Microsoft or Oracle or SAP or what have you, they're all beginning to recognize that the old model of just pushing licenses without trying to improve an experience is going by the wayside. Many of them are already, and you can see this in licensing agreements, they're changing licensing agreements, they're changing all, all of how they conduct business, but they're, all, but they're all making moves to try and understand how can they take the data that's embedded within their systems and improve the value for whatever experience they're talking about, whether it's gaming with Connect which, uh, or, um, or a back office process with a Pega or an Oracle. Um, so all of them are beginning to understand how to do this. I would say most of the really big innovation, like the really cool stuff that's going on, is not being driven by the, by the big enterprise app companies. And I would put Microsoft in that, even though they, they're big in consumer as well. Um, but you can already see the shift, right? Microsoft, and now, you know, where was Google 10 years ago? Nowhere, but now they're everywhere. So, and the reason that they're everywhere is because they're creating, not only, they're not only just pushing ads anymore, they're now beginning to convert their data into a better user experience, which Apple is, is terrific at. Yes? So I had an interesting experience. I was looking on Amazon for a, a charger for my phone, yeah. and I found one, but I didn't buy it, and then the next several days, I come open the browser and look at something, Kept How's your charger? Different ads on different sites. That's the code Halo too, but that it was increasing 
increase the experience, but it's also disturbing. It's very disturbing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and there's some really kind of, you know, it, and there's a, there's a chapter in the book where it's like, don't be creepy, right? And some of those things, if you think about this as, as a 20 or 30 year shift, and right, or right now we're in year one, right now you, we're getting pushed things, right? Google pushes this ads, uh, you know, Amazon's like, hey, have you found your charger yet? And, and so, and they're kind of like chasing us around. It's almost like a little cartoon where they're kind of running around. And, and um, I think that's going to pass, right? Because by and large, it's becoming the, the, the modern day equivalent of, of code spam. Because we don't want it, right? We, the bottom line is we don't want it. But companies now, some companies are beginning to get more sophisticated and not just trying to push you something or throw stuff at you and hope that it sticks, they're trying to engage you in a conversation. There are some banks, for example, that are, that are no longer, like if you, if you cl click on a bank, uh, it's like, well, what's your risk tolerance? I don't know. It depends. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about a loaded gun? Or are we talking, you know, I, I don't, it doesn't compute to me, right? But, and they realize that. And so now they're understanding that. And some banks are saying, well, you know, tell me more about you. And I'm like, well, okay, I'll do that if I get a better personalized experience. And so some companies are beginning to do that, but most are still in the, I'm going to throw something at you and hope that it sticks. But I think that is going to, that is going to change because these companies that are really asking you for stuff, like Disney or some of these banks, they're, they're cr trying to create a better experience, not a creepy, stalky experience. Well, like I've been watching that Nick, oh, I'm sorry, the Nick Silver guy. Nate, Nate. Does, Nate, I'm sorry, yeah. Nate. He does all this prediction, but I, none of them have actually, they all use polls and everything. And I wonder if they, someone wouldn't be right to use a code halo to get an idea of what the photo undercurrent is one way or another. They're trying to figure that out, and actually Nate is terrific, right? They're, they're, he's, he has created a more sophisticated way, you know, and, and it is a code halo story. It, 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 and he's, in fact, speaking at Cognizant Community in a couple of weeks. He, and so it, it is all about how do you make meaning out of the data. Now, he's not trying to create a beautiful customer experience. He's trying to understand a social shift. How are people going to vote? What are the demographics? How everything break down? And what's the probability of these things happening? But you're starting to see whether it's in retail or banking or insurance or life sciences, those are companies that are more likely to say, OK, you are going to um, uh, go through this life insurance process, right? Where right now, it's like you know, they, they <coughs> run the algorithms, and then they wait for you to die. And, so they're, and they realize that that's, you know, kind of creepy and a little bit unsatisfying. So they're trying to say, like, how do I help you improve your health over time? And so it's, these companies are beginning to engage more in a dialogue and get out of just, I'm going to you know, take a mega horn and shout at you. Yeah? It's interesting, it's interesting to hear you mention how the banks are trying to improve their user experience. Because just a couple days ago, I heard uh, a company adopted a path, a company dedicated to improving user experience bought out by Capital One. Isn't that interesting? I love that story. And that's not just the only one that's happening. Um, other banks are hiring designers as fast as they can get them through the door. So do you see the bank as becoming a code halo? Absolutely. They, they know this. Even though it's like privacy concerns of the one That is a great question, right? So privacy concerns in banking. Let's just stick with banking and we can talk about HIPAA and the other things. But banking, um, Cisco did a great study where they said, okay, what would you, if, would you give your code to a bank for a better customer experience? 70% of us said yes. So we would give them certain code with the assurance that they wouldn't be creepy and that they wouldn't be stupid. Now, we think, right, and we talk about this in the book, that companies more and more will be competing on their ability to engender trust. So if you say, OK, Wells Fargo or, or you know, Capital One, I'm going to give you this data. I'm going to answer your silly survey about, yes, I like to ride a bike and I don't like Justin Bieber. But I am going to entrust you with this data to give me a better experience. And if you don't, I'm going to go next door. And they're, you know, they're smart. They get that. They, they do understand that. And, <laughs> and banks, smart banks, are already starting to engage in that conversation. Because I'm granting them, and you're granting them permission to code in return for a better consumer experience. Now, if they screw it up, right, if they don't treat that with respect, and, they, and they're not transparent, and they don't let me leave, right, that's another thing that, that we talk about in the book, is being able to opt out, then they're going to lose in the market, right? It's going to be like, don't do business with Wells Fargo or Capital One, because it's just creepy, and then I got all these ads about my phone charger that I didn't want. But if they can say, look, here's your financial picture. 
you know, here's how many kids you have and what your fear, fears are and what your aspirations are. I can give you a better investment. That more and more people will sign up for that. It's a huge demographic shift too. I mean, you're seeing like my mom wouldn't sign up for that, but I would sign up for that. Yes. Well, there's a lot of dystopian possibilities for this. Yeah. How how predictive? If Facebook can tell your relationship, what about other? If you can use that Tom Cruise Minority Report, yeah. Yeah, and then like. Yeah, so Cognizant has some precogs, but we don't talk about yeah, it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's because we can, we know. Yeah, we just can't tell you. Um, so this is, I think, the um, technical, business, ethical, spiritual debate of our time. Is what's the how? What are, what's our relationship with the data and information that we're sharing? And it's you, you know, there are plenty of dystopian worldviews out there about that, right? You can look at uh, if you haven't read David Eggers' *The Circle*, I recommend it. It's it's a fantastic book because it's horrifying. Because uh, I read it because I think about this stuff all the time. It's part of my gig at Cognizant, and I read the first few pages. And I'm like, this is boring. But then I, then he just turned up the heat and it was like, this, he really painted a fantastic dystopian view of code and uh, unchecked capitalism. And it's awful, right? If you haven't read it, it's a, it's a, and he writes it beautifully. It's a great book. Um, so there's the Minority Report circle crowd, and then there's the everyone's going to sit around singing Kumbaya Star Trek crowd. The truth with all of these things is in the middle, and the truth is also up to us, right? So the companies that are um, transparent, right, that, don't, that aren't creepy, and our requirements of them will help us avoid moving into this digital dark age. The knee-jerk reaction is just unplug everything to hell with it. That's never happened, right? And the cost and the implications to all of us as a society would be catastrophic, right? And it's never happened in human history. So we're moving forward, and it's up, and, and I think, you know, and it's not hyperbole to state that this is one of the big challenges of us as a, as a, as a culture, as a society. And you're already starting to see, right? You can do certain things in Hong Kong that you can't do in China. And that's a big deal right now, right? People are betting big on how that all plays out right now today. And that's a, that's a, cho that's a cho social choice discussion. That's are we going to be a democracy within China or are we going to be subsumed by China? How do we share information? Because China is not sharing information. The United States has a much more open idea of, of sharing data. And in Europe, right, they're negotiating it every day. There's the right to be forgotten. There's Swiss privacy laws. There's German privacy laws. And it's complex and a pain in the neck to try and sort through. But if you step back and you can see us as a species, we're beginning to debate and discuss and pick a path on how do we do this? How do we balance personal privacy and security with the benefits we get from sharing information? And what information do we share? And how do we share it, right? I was, when I was with Forrester and before that I was a, another big technology company, I mean the big debate was, you know, what about the cloud? How is the cloud going to be secure? And the issue was, right, some things aren't appropriate for the cloud, right? There's a reason that the NSA has built their big data center in uh, Arizona or wherever, Nevada. Where is it? Bluff? Utah. Utah, right. There's a, there's a reason, right? There's, there are, you know, we can debate whether the right reasons are the wrong reasons, but there are reasons that we as a culture have said that's what we're going to do. And that debate playing out is that is a sign of a healthy democracy. I think that is a good thing. It's annoying, it's scary, it's weird, and we've never done anything quite like this, but it's a song of hope. It's not a dysto it's, the, the, the dystopian view is not inevitable. Well, you echo Andy McAbee in your second machine age, which is yeah. the FT. He's terrific. He's awesome, but he sort of says it's up to us, really. It is up to us. And, that, and you might look at that and go, well, that's kind of a punt, right? So some of the things, that, you know, you would say, well, that's a punt. Yeah, it's up to us, blah, blah, blah. I got things to do. But the fact is that we're making these choices every day, whether we, want, whether we realize it or not. As, it, as corporate citizens and, and as private citizens, these are the decisions we're making about how we share code. There's a reason that Facebook is getting beaten up almost every day. Because they have crossed the creepy line and they just will not, for whatever reason, back off of it. Google, on the other hand, they get beaten up every once in a while, but then they change their policy. You can now go to Google and say, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me my data back. 
And there, there's a tool that you can download, and it doesn't work all the time, but, but for, or for all their products, but it works for some of their products, and they're expanding it out. And you can, you can get that back. So, yeah. It was a very emphatic, I want to say something. Okay. How effective is that idea of actually getting something back once it's out there? I mean, I, I think that idea is amazing, but impractical. I right. assume that people are going to continue to use data after it's out there? Well, this, that's a great question, and there is no yes or no answer to that. So, but, so if you believe, if you believe in, if you believe in, ca you know, a capitalist democracy where there is an invisible hand and there are market forces that will shape things, then you, d you get away from the dystopian view. Because if I go to my bank and I say, I'm going to share my code for a better, you know, a better thing, and then all of a sudden my health insurance is uh, declined, or uh, I share my health code with a company and it's like, you know, my AIDS diagnosis gets out there or my, my genetic marker gets out there or something that, you know, if, that's a big deal, right? And we all think that that would be. And so when, when those happen, right, if you, so if, you, that, if that happens and if and when that happens and you buy the theory of, uh, of social democracy, companies that screw that up are gonna be punished. And so, I think there is an opportunity to enforce that. There's a social force that we are, as citizens, responsible for enforcing. Now, are bad things going to happen? Yes. Right? That's the downside. Bad things are going to happen. Data breaches are going to happen. iCloud is hacked. You know, you've got the Russians crawling all over the US banking system. Uh, no, we're not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. I mean, that, but those things are going to happen. Whether it's Russia or North Korea or China, those things are going to happen. Or ISIS, those are going to happen. So that's not going to go away, right? It's like Pandora's box, which wasn't a box, it was actually a jar. And when she opened it, all the bad stuff came out, but the last thing that came out was hope, right? And I, I think, right, and, I, and it's not, I'm not just, I'm not naive, right? I see these bad things happen all the time. But we as a society are making these choices right now to decide does hope thrive, or is it? Do we end up in a world like the Circle or Minority Report? Paul, have you seen anything, uh, any really interesting uses of uh, this data or, or the halos that you're talking about in sectors that, that we play in, so the consulting uh, space, or and dare I say, have you ever seen anything exciting in, in the government space? Yes. That, uh, is really interesting. This yes, way? actually, the government is. Uh, I talk more with private sector. Folks in with uh, with government sector, but the actual the, the the government is actually leading the charge in certain areas. And Department of Defense, counterintuitively, right, not known for being particularly nimble or quick on some of these. They they see this coming, and they've already started getting value out of it. They do um, they they do uh, application testing. They crowdsource application testing to look for security breaches. They're they're even connecting um, uh, design of physical things like troop carriers to, to using technology to create um, a social community around that to shorten time and decrease costs. And it's working very well. We're getting a lot of, um, uh, with a, a government in Asia um, was interested in talking to us about how do we, how do we have, uh, use code halos to help with federal services being provided to uh, different constituent groups in this country. So, so more and more governments are, are doing this and beginning to figure out what value can it have. So in, and the U.S. federal government, particularly the Department of Defense, is, De Defense is doing some really interesting things. The, the post office, I forgot the post office. The post office is actually trying to create, uh, you know, n n to, they're trying to avoid their own extinction event. Um, by bringing the Internet of Things into the postal system. So creating a code halo around packages and letters and things that we would ship. So yeah, the US federal government is, is really doing a lot here. Last question? Good. Building on that, um, many of these companies are using cloud computing for advertising and getting mm -hmm. more money. Within the government sector or us, how, are there examples of using it for something else? Or something more? Uh, I mean, I get the increased user experience, but it's increased user experience so that we can then earn more. 
there oh I get you yeah so absolutely so yeah the and some of the data that I kind of flipped through and, and it goes into more detail in the book it's just it's not just about the consumer experience that's where people land but but if you look at all of the elements of where code halos are playing out around a brand so bringing uh, you know brand awareness up for it whether it's a, pr uh, a private sector uh, company or an agency trying to serve a particular constituency so those things are happening supply chain back office processes as well employees right employee bases um, there's a uh, big and they're public with this so Google is is doing um, uh, they're trying to understand their employee code halos so that they can create a better more engaged employee workforce and so they've asked some, some, some of their folks to share their personal code halo. So if I'm a Googler, I can, you know, what I do on, just like you, like all of us, right? If we do work on a company system, it's their property. But what I do on my home system is my, that's my own business. And Google said to a bunch of their folks, would you share this data with us so that we can try and create a better Google experience? And, and a bunch of people signed up for it. They don't, which is really kind of cool because they don't know what they're going to find out. Um, but people opted in and now, I don't know where they are with that study, but so, so, so the, the answer to your question is yes, it's not just about the consumer experience, that's where a lot of heat is right now, but there are also a growing number of, of, of examples where that's happening in other parts of the value chain. Sign some books. I'd be glad, thank you so much for the questions. This, uh, this is really terrific, thank you. Good thank you. Thanks so much. We have a uh, oh, pen for you oh, to do a awesome, little signing man. with. Thank you, you very much. All right.